A young girl from a small town went for a run and disappeared without a trace. The police, the FBI, and hundreds of local residents were looking for her. People hoped to the last that they would find her alive and unharmed. But this solution shocked the once friendly and close-knit community. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Sydney Sutherland. Sydney Sutherland was born on September 18, 1995 in the small American town of Tuckerman, Arkansas. She grew up in a large, friendly family. She had two brothers and loving parents. After graduating from high school with honors, Sydney entered Arkansas State University. By that time, she already knew for sure that she wanted to devote her life to medicine and help people. After four years, she received her license as a nurse practitioner, after which she completed a year-long advanced training course. The girl got a job at the Newport Medical Center. Although the town itself was very small, the hospital was quite large and received patients from all over the area. Sydney was passionate about her work, cared deeply about her patients, and quickly gained the affection of her colleagues. By that time, she lived with her boyfriend Alex, with whom she had been together for four years, and constantly visited her parents, because their town was only 15 minutes away. It was summer 2020. Sydney was 24 at the time, and was preparing to celebrate her upcoming birthday. In August, the girl had a vacation, and she and her parents flew to Miami to see her brothers. On August 19, she went to visit her mother. Sydney was in a great mood, and before leaving, she said that she was going to go straight home. The girl also added that she plans to bake something this evening, and go for a run before that. At about 5 p.m., my mother received a call from Sydney's boyfriend. He said he returned home, but the girl was not there. By that time, she should have already returned from her run, but Sydney seemed to have disappeared. She did not answer calls or messages. All her things were at home, and her car was parked in the garage. Her mother was seriously worried, so she immediately came to their house. Together with Alex, they decided to go on a search, calling Sydney's friends and relatives along the way. They drove along the route where the girl usually ran, but could not find her. Considering that the town was very small, Mom and Alex quickly drove around it completely, after which they decided to contact the police. The girl's mother even called the mobile operator with a request to track the location of Sydney's phone and smartwatch. However, they could only do this at the request of the police. By that time, the news about the girl's disappearance had spread throughout Newport. Despite the fact that night was approaching, dozens of people came to Sydney's house, wanting to take part in the search. Soon the police arrived at the scene and, together with volunteers, they began to comb the entire city. Detectives concluded that there was a high probability that the girl could have been kidnapped. She could not have gone far without a car. Her wallet and documents were left at home. In addition, during a visit to her mother, Sydney said that she was going home and did not plan to go anywhere else. That evening, the FBI joined the case, and the number of volunteers exceeded 150 people. Soon three helicopters and dog handlers with search dogs joined the search. However, it was already too dark outside, and this made the work more difficult. Sydney's relatives created a group on a social network and disseminated relevant information. Alex looked at the recording from the surveillance camera installed in front of their garage and saw that the girl came home from her mother and about an hour and a half later went for a run. She was wearing sportswear, which is why investigators were finally convinced that Sydney disappeared while jogging. Soon they managed to find a first witness. The driver of the courier service told police that he saw the girl running along the 18th road, which connects New Porto with the town of Grubbs. This happened at about half past three in the afternoon. The girl's boyfriend and mother confirmed that the girl often ran along this route. Police could now focus their efforts on a more specific area where the girl was last seen. They decided to continue the search the next day, dismissing the volunteers around 2 a.m. On the morning of August 20, more volunteers joined the search, concentrating along Route 18. Soon they managed to discover the first serious clue. 
Police found Sydney's smartphone in a field near the intersection of Route 18 and Jackson Road 41. They were helped in this by information provided by the girl's cellular operator. Another interesting find awaited them in a barn located at the edge of the field. Sydney's broken sink glasses were found there. All this only strengthened the police version of the abduction, but they still did not have any leads that would help them find the girl. Detectives also considered Sydney's boyfriend as a suspect, since these types of crimes are most often committed by loved ones. But Alex provided them with an alibi for the time of her disappearance, confirming that he was in another place. In addition, Sydney's relatives and friends said that the couple did not have any serious problems. The girl never complained about Alex. Soon, another witness contacted investigators and said that he saw Sydney jogging along Route 41, approximately in the same place where her smartphone was found. He drove by in his pickup truck, and this happened after the girl was noticed by the driver of the courier service. Given that he may have been the last person to see Sydney before the abduction, the police decided to check on him as part of standard procedure. 28-year-old Quay Cleveland lived on a large form. He had a wife with three children from his first marriage. His family was very wealthy and owned large areas of land. A few years earlier, they even won an honorary farming competition. The men also took part in the search for Sydney as a volunteer from the first day of her disappearance. And here the police noticed one strange moment. Quake, for some reason, did not immediately tell them that he had seen the missing girl, although he knew about her disappearance and was among the volunteers. In this case, the witness should have immediately contacted investigators and told what he saw. But for some reason the man did not do this right away. The next day, August 21, the police decided to talk to him. Quake stated that he did not consider this information important for the investigation and decided to talk about it only after he realized that he could be the last person to see Sydney before the abduction. The man cooperated with the investigation and voluntarily agreed to provide them with his smartphone. It had an application installed on it used to track and locate family members. For example, parents use it so that they can see where their child is at any time. Using this application, detectives established that around 4 o'clock on the day of Sydney's disappearance, Quake's smartphone had been in almost the same place for some time, in a field located several kilometers from where her phone was found. The police went there and found that literally a few meters from this place, there was a small dug-up piece of land. There were also boot prints on it which were recorded by officers as evidence. Having dug this hole, they found a woman's body there. Medical examiners have confirmed that the deceased is Sydney Sutherland. The cause of death was multiple injuries on the body of unknown origin. It looked as if she had received a series of blows. Considering that Quake Levelin was at the very place where Sydney was found, he also became the main suspect. Forensics examined his pickup truck, and found traces of blood on the back door, which were sent to the laboratory. DNA testing showed that the blood belonged to Sydney. Based on all this, the police charged Quake with murder. They decided to search his house, where some more evidence was waiting for them. Firstly, the man's relatives did not try to shield him in any way, but on the contrary, they tried to help the investigator. They provided surveillance footage from the farm, and pointed them to a dent that appeared on Quake's pickup truck the day Sydney disappeared. Camera footage confirmed that this damage did not occur in the morning, but in the evening Quake arrived home in a dented car. In the house itself, detectives found shoes, the soles of which completely matched the footprints on the victim's burial. The cameras also showed that he was wearing these exact shoes on the day the girl disappeared. All this evidence indicated that Quake had a direct connection to the girl's death. And at the very first interrogation, to the surprise of the police, he did not deny this. The man said that that day he was doing a routine inspection of the fields belonging to his family. While driving his pickup along Route 41, he saw Sydney running. Having driven past, the man at some point turned around and drove the car straight at the girl. As a result, she received serious injuries. Next, Quake loaded her into the back of his pickup truck, 
and drove to the field where her body would later be found. At that time, the girl had already died from her injuries. The men raped her, then dug a hole and left Sydney there. In the evening, as if nothing had happened, he returned home and tried to forget about what had happened. It is noteworthy that Quake and Sydney knew each other, as did many residents of this small town. They attended the same school several years apart, but detectives say they never interacted much. Thus, the police had everything they needed to take the case to court. As usual, its beginning was delayed for months, during which the suspect was in prison. Quake's family hired him a good lawyer, with whom he constantly communicated, waiting for the trial to begin. And at some point, Quake retracted his initial confession and decided to contest the charge. In this regard, the court had to prove his guilt without taking into account the fact that he initially confessed. He also underwent a medical examination, which showed some mental disorders. According to the doctor's report, Quake may indeed not have realized the seriousness of his crime, but his disorder is not sufficient to avoid punishment. This meant that the prosecutor could now seek the death penalty. According to Quake's new story, he did hit Sydney on Route 41, but it was an accident. The man allegedly drove past her, after which he turned around and raised dust on the road, because of which he did not see the girl running on the side of the road and hit her. He got scared and panicked, so he decided to bury the body to avoid punishment. This version seemed quite weak. Quake was asked why he turned around in the middle of the road and drove back, to which we received a rather strange answer. The man said that he simply decided to ask if Sydney was okay. The dust argument has also been questioned and refuted. The road on which all this happened was indeed covered with earth, but at the same time, it was physically impossible for so much dust to rise there to block the driver's view. The police drove along it several times and were convinced of this. Despite all this, Quake now had to defend himself in court, which was delayed for many months. This was largely facilitated by his lawyer, who overwhelmed the court with various demands. He asked for the trial to be moved to another county because he feared his client would not receive a fair trial in the city where many knew and loved Sydney. In total, the lawyer sent about 50 demands to the court, some of which were frankly absurd. For example, he tried to achieve a ban on displays of emotion in the courtroom, including by the victim's relatives. A little over a year had passed since Quake's arrest, and the trial was about to begin. The prosecutor assured that he would seek the death penalty, and at some point the suspect decided to make a deal. He agreed to admit to intentionally killing Sydney and abusing her if he was given a life sentence. The victim's relatives agreed to this deal, and the court accepted it. On October 1, 2021, Quake formally confessed to his crime before a judge, after which he was found guilty and sentenced to life without parole. As expected, his motive was the desire to commit a violent act against Sydney. Having passed her, he made a decision and turned around, especially intending to run her down. Standing before the judge in the presence of the victim's family and friends, the offender showed no remorse. Sydney's mother demanded that he look into her eyes but his face was devoid of any emotion. The girl's parents said that they were completely satisfied with the life sentence for the killer. They did not want the process to drag on for years, during which they would have to listen to ridiculous versions of justification. Now, on the anniversary of Sydney's death, friends and relatives gather on the very road where she was hit and organize a memorial procession. A memorial has also been erected there to commemorate this tragic and inhumane crime. As for Quake's relatives, all this was a huge blow for them. They always had a reputation as a decent and friendly family who earned their living through hard farming work. They could not believe that their son was capable of murder, but they recognized that he should be held accountable for what he had done and did not try to help shield him.